In this video, we'll finish up talking about the blood. So we've talked about red blood cells, we've talked about white blood cells, and as far as the cellular components of the blood, uh, there's only one more left, and that's uh, platelet. And so that's where we will pick up today. So jumping over to my PowerPoint, this is a photo of a blood smear, as you know. This is from the book, and so you can see the erythrocytes all over. We can see the leukocytes, you know, how different they look, and hopefully you know how to differentiate one type from another with those. And then platelets are these little kind of like dot looking things. So that's a platelet. And here's a whole cluster of platelets. So platelets are not full cells. Uh, platelets are formed from the hemocytoblast. And so just as a little reminder, we looked at this in the last video, the hemocytoblast is the stem cell that gives rise to all other blood cells, including platelets. And so the hemocytoblast, once it differentiates into the myeloid stem cell, uh, it will give rise to something called a megakaryocyte. And so I'm going to go to a picture in the book that shows um, how platelets are produced. So they're showing us the hemocytoblast will give rise to the megakaryoblast and ultimately the megakaryocyte, like I mentioned. This is a gigantic cell that exists in the bone marrow. It doesn't circulate around. So, you know, on a peripheral blood draw, we're never going to find any of these. It um, actually replicates its DNA like several times without dividing, and it turns into, you know, this, like I said, giant cell that kind of like disintegrates within the bone marrow. And the little fragments of that cell are platelets. So platelets don't have any organelles. They're literally just small fragments from the megakaryocyte. And so the whole function of platelets is blood clotting. They help to initiate a blood clot. So taking a look at our notes, um, the formation and structure of platelets, they come from this cell called the megakaryocyte, which is this um, really big cell that exists in the bone marrow. They don't circulate around. Uh, what they do is they kind of fall apart into hundreds of thousands of little pieces called platelets, um, also known as thrombocytes. So platelets don't have the nucleus or organelles, and they have a very short lifespan. You know, I have 9 to 12 days or even, say, like 5 to 6 days. Uh, they're uh, not going to last long because they're just, like like we said, a little fragment of a uh, cell. So what platelets do is they help to initiate a, a blood clot. So we talked about this um, a little bit last time, or maybe in uh, video 1 how we have this finite amount of blood. So we have, you know, say approximately five liters of blood. So it's really important that if we uh, have some type of leak in the system, you know, uh, an injury, a hemorrhage of some kind, that we want to minimize that uh, blood loss. And the best way that we can do that is through blood clot formation for the blood to coagulate so no more can leak out of the system. So um, the way that that works basically is that our blood vessels, which we'll talk about in two weeks, our blood vessels, all of them, are lined with this really smooth, slick um, tissue called endothelium. It's simple squamous epithelium. You might remember it from last semester. And it provides, like I said, just like a really slippery lining to the blood vessel. And so all blood cells just move through it, hopefully, without adhering. Uh, platelets uh, will stick to anything that's not endothelium, which means that if there's an injury uh, and uh, connective tissue, collagen is exposed within the blood vessel, platelets will start to stick to that, and that, that will start the initiation of a blood clot. Uh, but at any rate, there are three uh, hemostatic mechanisms that uh, come into play when we have injury to a uh, blood vessel. And they take place in this order. Vasoconstriction is just constriction of the smooth muscle wall of the blood vessel. And so with vasoconstriction, this is short-lived, but um, vasoconstriction will kind of fill in the gap until like platelet plug and blood clot formation start forming. And so it fills in a gap there. So if we uh, had injury to a blood vessel and the smooth muscle wall or even like the surrounding tissue is damaged, it will cause um, constriction in the blood vessel. And it's kind of like, say, if I had uh, a leak in the hose and I just like, you know, pinch, pinch the hose shut, 
I would get less water, you know, leaving. That's what vasoconstriction is all about. Uh, next, what would happen is, like we said, the platelets are going to adhere to any foreign surface. And so when they adhere to a foreign surface, this was called um, a platelet plug formation. So I'm going to move on in the notes talking about a blood clot, because to start a blood clot, you first have to have a platelet plug. So there's no such thing as just having a blood clot or a platelet plug. And so a platelet plug is just when platelets um, stick to the foreign surface. And then they start releasing some um, chemical messengers that uh, make other platelets adhere. And so serotonin is one of those chemical messengers. And then if you remember, uh, we talked about eicosanoids in the last unit. Uh, thromboxane is an eicosanoid, and platelets also release that, and it's going to cause other platelets to start to adhere. And that uh, the platelet plug, once it's formed, will um, be stabilized by the addition of a protein that weaves its way uh, through. The protein is called fibrin, and uh, fibrin is always uh, in our blood in a soluble form. So there is a protein in the blood called fibrinogen. It's soluble fibrin. And so in order to stabilize the platelet plug, or in other words, to make a blood clot, what a blood clot starts as is, is this addition of fibrin to get that soluble fibrinogen precipitating out of solution and turning into fibrin. So fibrin has a structure like you probably imagine it with a name like fibrin. You know, it's very fibrous and it weaves its way through um, the platelet plug and it, and it strengthens it so much so that red blood cells start sticking and then the fibrin keeps weaving through and red blood cells stick and that's what you call a blood clot. Once you have this addition of fibrin and um, red blood cells start sticking. So there are two mechanisms that precipitate fibrinogen into the solid strands of fibrin. So those two mechanisms are the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. And basically, you know, both of these pathways, remember, really what we're looking for is production of fibrin. How are we going to get the fibrinogen to turn into fibrin? And so we can do that in these two different ways, intrinsic or extrinsic pathway. So the intrinsic pathway just basically means that our blood has the innate ability to clot. Okay, it has that intrinsic ability. You don't have to add anything to the blood. That if the blood contacts a foreign surface, it will clot. You know, think about it. If you took a drop of blood and you put it on a clean glass slide or, you know, a uh, drop of blood from uh, an injury, it starts to coagulate. You know, it doesn't stay uh, fluid and it doesn't require us to do anything. That's the intrinsic pathway. The thing about the intrinsic pathway is there's more steps to the intrinsic pathway. If we had tissue damage, um, a, a factor, a chemical messenger is released, tissue thromboplastin, or in our book they say tissue factor. And what that does is it makes the number of steps to get to fibrin quicker. You know, it makes it makes less steps. So the extrinsic pathway means that we have something that was extrinsically added to the blood, this tissue thromboplastin, and that came from the damaged tissue and that's going to speed this process up. So I'm going to jump over to some pictures and see what you think about these. So here's a picture from our book that goes through those three hemostatic mechanisms that we talked about. You know, notice that they're showing in the first picture uh, damage to the, the vessel. Okay, so we can see that injury to the vessel. Blood would be leaking out there, but these arrows that are pointing in they're trying to indicate vasoconstriction. So vasoconstriction, like I said, is a constricting, you know, a constriction of that opening so that the diameter is smaller, like pinching the hose shut. Okay, so vasoconstriction or vascular spasm, that will, that's immediate. Then what will happen is because there are uh, collagen fibers, connective tissue, that is now being exposed. Remember, this was that smooth, slick endothelium. What will happen is the platelets, which they're drawing as little purple pieces here, platelets will start to stick. And so not only do we want the platelets to say, like, cover up that injury, I don't want it to just cover up and all the blood keeps going by it, 
the platelets release these chemical messengers that are going to cause all the platelets going by to stick. So we get all of these platelets. And that's what you can see here. So that's a platelet plug. That's what we were talking about. So platelet plug forms. And then if we had um, tissue thromboplastin because of this injury in the blood, that is going to cause a chain reaction to occur that's going to bring fibrin, precipitate fibrin from the soluble fibrinogen out of the blood. And so, you know, you know, you can't see the purple in this picture anymore. It's because they're trying to show you that this, you know, like brown fiber, fibrin has gone through. Uh, but take a look at this. Here's an electron micrograph of red blood cells caught in fibrin. So fibrin is that cobweb looking stuff in there. So it's very extensive, you know, protein um, infrastructure makes it a lot stronger. Here's another photo of red blood cells uh, caught in fibrin. So that's what I'm talking about. We need this uh, protein, that, this fibrous protein, fibrin, to start weaving through the platelet plug. Red blood cells start sticking, and then more fibrin and more red blood cells stick, and that's what you call a um, blood clot. So like we were saying, with uh, a blood clot, what you really need, you know, and I jumped right to the end of this process, you can see I'm already in phase three, what we need is the formation of fibrin. We need this insoluble, you know, fibrous protein to start weaving through the cells, which comes from fibrinogen, which is a normal component of the blood, so that's always out there floating around. And so what is going to lead to fibrinogen solidifying, precipitating out into fibrin? Um, as we mentioned, there's a, a, a long chain of reactions. There's actually, you know, 30 reactions or so that are involved here. So a lot of reactions, we're not going to go through those, but I just want to show you the difference between the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. So intrinsic, um, you can notice how many steps are necessary to get to prothrombin activating factor, and that's uh, where our other slide was, that's going to activate prothrombin into thrombin, and then thrombin will um, activate the fibrinogen into fibrin. So this is the long way. This is our blood's innate ability to clot. And all of these Roman numerals that you see in these reactions, those are clotting factors. So the clotting factors are numbered in Roman numerals in the order in which they were discovered, which makes this, you know, a bit of a challenge to learn, but we're not worried about you know, what clotting factors are doing or, you know, we're not learning this biochemical pathway, not at all. But I, I want to show you how if you have tissue damage, tissue cell trauma, that the tissue will secrete something. So this is ex extrinsic, right? This came from outside of the blood. Extrinsically, the damaged tissue put this SOS factor, tissue factor, or tissue thromboplastin into the blood and it took m many fewer steps to get to the prothrombin activator. So the only other thing that I'm going to point out here before we go on to um, the other picture again is the need for calcium. So do you notice how calcium is required for some of these reactions? We talked about that in AP1 and we talked about that in endocrinology in the last unit because we were saying, you know, this is one of the reasons that we would hormonally regulate our blood calcium levels because it's needed for so many vital processes and blood, clot blood clotting is one of those. So either the intrinsic or extrinsic pathway will um, lead us to prothrombin activator. And then to go to the next slide, uh, we can see the prothrombin activator is going to convert prothrombin into thrombin. Okay, so those are two other clotting factors. And then um, thrombin is what does this conversion of the fibrinogen to fibrin. That's, this is the only part of the pathway that I wrote in the notes, and so let's take a look at that. Okay, so um, so I talk about if there, the shortcut and the uh, long way, and then in the end, there is a common pathway. Okay, so you saw how the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway all came to one area where we got the prothrombin uh, activator and that is going to activate prothrombin into thrombin, and then thrombin is what converts the fibrinogen into fibrin. You should be familiar with this common pathway, and um, you don't have to worry about uh, 
knowing the steps of the other pathways. But please understand the difference between the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway. So once we have fibrin production, fibrin is going to weave its way through the platelet plug and then red blood cells stick and now you have a blood clot. And once you have a blood clot, what will happen is clot retraction. Uh, basically the platelets uh, adhere to uh, the fibrin that's weaving through and it pulls the fibrin in tighter. If this makes any sense, here's, here's a, a science fair model for you. If I had a cotton ball and I took a needle and thread and I weave it just randomly all through the cotton ball, I'm going to say the cotton ball is like my red blood cells and platelets, and then the thread is like the fibrin. Can you imagine after we, you know, weave the thread all through the cotton ball, I could take the two ends of the thread and I could pull it as tight as I could, and that would shrink the cotton ball down to like a really dense, smaller area. That's what clot retraction is. So clot retraction is when the blood clot just, you know, reduces its size. That's going to reduce the amount of um, repair, you know, the space of repair that we're going to need to do. So repair is going to occur just like we learned about in AP1. If you can replace those cells, like epithelial cells, will divide by mitosis. Or if it's connective tissue, if it's the dermis, then you make new connective tissue. That's called fibrosis. That's going to be scar formation. And so repair involves both of those processes. And then as repair occurs, fibrinolysis will also occur. And fibrinolysis is just uh, that the fibrin dissolves over time, which makes sense. So the blood clot is not a permanent structure. The fibrin is going to dissolve over time, so clot disintegrates. The uh, videos that I have on blood clot formation, you might uh, like those because they show like a little animation on, um, on the process. So a few disorders that we need to know uh, with platelets, you could have undesirable clotting. In other words, we want the blood to clot when there's a leak in the system, but we don't want the blood to clot when there's not. So you can see there's, there's this delicate balance between the blood staying fluid and the blood clotting which is, you know, one reason that it makes sense that there's so many um, reactions that bring about a clot. So an un undesirable clot hopefully is going to be prevented by heparin. You remember what type of uh, white blood cell makes that? Uh, and um, the endothelium. Okay, so the smooth, slick endothelium uh, helps the um, cells not to adhere. But if a clot does form, that's known as a thrombus. So a thrombus is a clot development in an unbroken vessel. And if that blood clot breaks free, that's what's called an embolus. Now we would have a free-floating blood clot in the circulation, and that's extremely dangerous uh, because that can get stuck in a small blood vessel, like a small vessel servicing the myocardium, a small vessel servicing the brain. Okay, so... That could cause uh, a heart attack or a stroke. It could get stuck in the lungs. That's a pulmonary embolism. So um, embolus, very, you know, life-threatening um, condition. Now, opposite end of that would be bleeding, you know, unwanted uh, bleeding. The, clot, the clot's not forming when we want it to form. And so uh, two diseases that we want to be familiar with thrombocytopenia, which technically is um, not a disease, so to speak. It, it's just a low platelet count. And so low platelet count could be due to many different reasons. Um, infection, widespread hemorrhage. Uh, it can lead to something called petechiae. Petechiae would be just random um, uh, blood loss within the body. I'm going to show you a picture of petechiae. Okay, so unwanted bleeding. Uh, and so suppression, destruction of the bone marrow could be a reason for the thrombocytopenia. Or if the blood doesn't clot because of a genetic lack of one of those clotting factors. So remember the clotting factors with the Roman numerals? If, if genetically we lack one of those, or if genetically uh, one of those doesn't work, uh, so if a clotting factor is absent or non-functional, that's what hemophilia is. So hemophilia um, 
would be a condition where the person is genetically unable to um, uh, form a blood clot. So our last topic, uh, ABO blood types, this might be, I put it at the end of the blood, this might be a little misplaced, um, I'm not sure. Well, I, I think I would put this in a different place next time, but ABO blood types, uh, the reason that I say that is because ABO blood type has to do with red blood cells. Okay, it doesn't have to do with white blood cells, it doesn't have to do with platelets. So when you talk about ABO blood type, like if a person has type A or type O blood, what they're talking about is the presence of, uh, or absence of two, oops, I have glycoprotein in the notes, it's technically, it's a glycolipid. So in other words, it's a, um, it's a sugar that's attached right to the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so it's genetically determined presence or absence of um, two different glycolipid antigens, as we would say, on the surface of erythrocytes. So these two uh, sugars, these two antigens are antigen A and antigen B. So with antigen A and antigen B, you can have one or you could have the other. You could have A or B, or you could have both, or you could have neither. And there are the four conditions of the ABO uh, blood types. And then um, the other part of this is that the person will spontaneously produce antibodies, or maybe I should say automatically there instead of spontaneously, but they will automatically produce antibodies against any antigen that they do not have. And so let's take a look at this um, chart that I drew for us. So what I was trying to show here is that if you, a person with type A blood, what that means is that they have antigen A on, their, on the surface of their red blood cells. So these are all red blood cells. Remember, nothing to do with white blood cells or platelets. So if we have this uh, glycolipid A on the surface of the red blood cells, we'd say it's type A. If you have antigen B, I'd say it's type B. If you have both A and B, so you can see I'm using shapes for this, on the surface of the red blood cells, that's type AB. And then if you don't have either A or B, um, that is what type O is. So this is, I think, you know, the easiest, you know, this is very intuitive, right? This is pretty easy to understand. Here's the part that's a little bit, I think, tougher to understand. And that's um, this column. And I think this is the most important column, the antibodies that are present in the plasma. So when a person is born, uh, they're not born with these antibodies, but between like two and eight months uh, uh, of age, they will produce, a person will produce antibodies against the antigen, any antigen that they don't have. And so here, because the person has antigen A, they're producing anti-B antibodies. Because here the person has B, they're producing anti-A antibodies. A person with antigens A and B, like in type AB blood, they're not going to produce antibodies against A or B, right? Because they're both um, uh, self. Uh, a person with type O doesn't have antigen A or antigen B and will produce both anti-A and anti-B. And so the reason that I say that this is, you know, the harder thing is really not harder, but really when you have, have transfusion questions, this is the column that you want to think of. Because if a person is producing antibodies against something, then the last thing that you want to give them is anything with that uh, antigen. So if a person is producing anti-B, we do not want to give B in any form. And so looking down this list, you see how type B and type AB both have antigen B. We could never give B or AB to a type A. You know, you could give type A because that doesn't have any B. We could give type O because that doesn't have any B, and those would be the only possibilities. I'm going to talk about RH factor, the positive and minus, in a minute. Okay, so we'll take this one step at a time. So type B uh, is producing anti-A. So think this through with me. You can't give A. You could give B. You can't give AB because there's the A, but we could give O. Now, if we don't have any antibodies like the person with AB, then if we're only worried about the antibodies, we can give anything, right? Sounds good. We can give A, we can give B, we can give AB, 
and uh, we could give O. Compared to a person with type O, a person with type O is producing anti-A and anti-B. So you couldn't give any blood product with A or B. They'd have to take O. And so you can see in this chart why uh, a person with type AB blood would be considered the universal recipient because they can take anything. Compared to type O blood is considered to be the universal donor because anyone can take that blood. And you might wonder, you know, about this. And so let me just talk about this for a second. Um, with type O blood, like we're saying anybody can take type O blood, but we're also saying that type O is, has anti-A and anti-B antibodies. So if we perfuse, if we transfused type O whole blood into somebody with type A, who, you know, we're saying could take O, then we would be putting these anti-A and anti-B antibodies into that person's blood. And that, that is true. And what would happen is this anti-A would react with their A, but it would be a finite reaction, right? You don't, you'd give a certain amount of it. It would, it would react until it's, until it all reacted. And then that reaction is done. That's not ideal. What really is going to happen is there, these antibodies exist in the plasma. So they would, um, just give the packed red blood cells. They're not going to give the plasma. So in other words, we're going to dump this out and then just give the, uh, red blood cells with the no antigen on the surface. That's how uh, that works. Um, and, and just to contrast that, like if we gave uh, type A uh, blood, let's say we gave them um, a type B, well, they're producing anti-B, so we know they're going to react against that B, but the thing is because they produce anti-B and now they're threatened with anti-B, with B, with the antigen B, they're going to start making anti-B, and we can't stop them from making anti-B. They're going to make anti-B way too much of it, and they're going to be in, you know, crisis situation. So that's the difference. This is not a finite amount. This is being produced by the, by the recipient. And so there's no medication that brings that to an end. So last, uh, let me tell you about RH factor. RH factor is um, another blood grouping method, so it's a, it's a separate than ABO. Uh, there's actually hundreds of blood grouping methods. You can look at that in the book. ABO is a really common one, and so is RH factor. As a matter of fact, they usually put them together by saying like O negative or A positive, and the positive and negative is this RH factor. Because here you're looking at the presence or absence of a single antigen. People call it antigen D or call it RH factor, but this is also on the surface of red blood cells. So because there's only one antigen, I hope it makes sense that you either have it or you don't. That's the positive or the negative. Um, but one big difference, this is a huge difference, is unlike ABO, no one is going to spontaneously or automatically produce anti-RH antibodies without exposure to RH. So in other words, you know, this column is not present with RH. No one's going to produce anti-RH antibodies unless they're exposed to RH. So with that in mind, let's talk about this a little bit more. So if we look at the population in general, you know, basically we're saying that if we say, you know, positive, that, that, that you have this antigen, okay, so we have our H factor, uh, compared to say, if we say that a person is negative, all that we're saying is they don't have that antigen. So they don't have antigen D or RH factor, whatever we want to call it. Okay, so they either have it or they don't have it. They're positive or negative. So about 85% of the population is positive. So most of the population is RH positive, which means that there's only like 15% of the population that's um, negative. And so we said that no one is going to produce antibodies against RH factor unless they're exposed to RH factor. So let's think about that. 85% of the population has RH factor. And so this population is never making anti-RH antibodies. Does that make sense? Because they already have RH factor, so they're not going to make antibodies against, you know, an antigen that they have. So... Most people are never going to make anti-RH antibodies, but this segment of the population that don't have RH factor 
they would make antibodies against RH if they were exposed to RH, which in itself is not a problem. Uh, somebody with RH negative blood exposed to RH can make antibodies against RH positive. But here's the problem. Here's the classic problem. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so in this picture, what they're showing us is uh, the classic problem of RH negative mother uh, and uh, the fetus is RH positive. Keep in mind, 85% of the population is RH positive. It's a dominant trait. And so chances are, statistically, that the fetus is RH positive. So here they're showing us um, during development, this is the placenta, we've learned about this. Here's mother's blood, it's RH negative, fetus's blood, RH positive, the two don't mix, no problem at all, right? So at delivery, what will happen is um, they, mother and um, offspring will be exposed to each other's blood. So the placenta is going to separate uh, from the uterus and um, the, the person is going to be exposed to RH factor, which, like we said, in itself is not a problem. So here, later on in time, what we're seeing is RH negative mother has produced antibodies. These are those Y-shaped things uh, against RH. In itself, no problem. Somebody transfuses this person with RH positive, problem. But here's, here's the real thing that people worry about uh, a second pregnancy. Because in a second pregnancy, RH negative mother producing antibodies against RH, true, the blood doesn't mix, but an antibody is just a protein. And so those antibodies, anti-RH antibodies, will cross the placenta and they will start to coagulate the offspring's blood. And this can be a very serious, you know, possibly uh, fatal situation. And so in order to avoid this, uh, what we do is during gestation and then at a certain period um, surrounding delivery, we deliver RH um, anti-RH antibodies to the mother as, um, as a preventative treatment. And so what we would do is, you know, as a medication, it's an injection, it's called Rogam. I'm sure um, a lot of you are familiar with this. We would give the uh, anti-RH antibodies and as long as this person has anti-RH antibodies from the injection, they're not stimulated to make their own. That's what we want to avoid, right? Because this would be a finite amount. They would react with any RH that the mother was exposed to, and mother didn't have to make uh, her own anti-RH antibodies. Um, and so that's how uh, that works. So the anti-RH antibodies, um, the anti-D antibodies that are present in Rogam are... Uh, are produced by humans. So um, RH negative people who want to um, donate their blood uh, for production of Rogam can be injected with RH factor. They start producing antibodies against RH and then uh, they are paid for their blood and then their blood is used to um, harvest these anti-RH antibodies to make this medication. So um, we will be back next week and talk about the heart. Thank you.